Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, are we well? That is the pertinent question for today's session. Can a workplace be a well place? For those of you who don't know me, I'm Peter Langford. I'm the director of Voice Project. I have the pleasure of being the MC um, for today. I will introduce our speakers in a little bit more detail when they get to deliver their own presentations. But to formally kick off today's event, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet and pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, I would like to thank the, the time of, uh, thank our speakers for their time and energy putting into today. So there's a lot of preparation that goes into these sessions. So Lou, Claire and Lucy, thank you very much for, um, for your contribution. Um, a little bit of admin for today. We will be taking questions as we go through. I believe there's a little blue hand icon in the top right hand section of your screen where you can um, submit your questions and they'll come through to us and uh, we'll moderate those and I'll pass those on to the speakers a little bit later. The format for today's session, um, I'll do a little bit of an introduction. Um, we will go through um, our three speakers. They'll each have eight or so minutes to deliver our little mini presentations. Um, we'll do it in the order of um, Lou, Claire and Lucy, which broadly follows a pattern of research, practice, policy. Now that paints their presentations a little bit too black and white, but it gives you a feel for the, the type of content that they will um, deliver. And um, the, the, their presentations will also be available later, so uh, we'll email those out to everyone who's registered for the event. Um, before I dive into the presentations, I thought I'd give you a little bit of an update of what's been happening at Voice Project for those um, of you who know us, or indeed for those of you who don't know us. Um, we've uh, recently just expanded our office, so there's, there's a, a nice friendly shot of most of us in the, the screen. Um, if you have been to our office, you'd know that there's a wall right there, or well, there was a wall right there, and we've uh, nabbed a bit of space from our neighbours, so it's been a big event for us, um, uh, fitting that out for, for this year. We've also... I'm trying to click through, there we go. Um, last year or so we've spent a big chunk of time um, researching a new shorter, more efficient engagement survey. So for those of you who've been working with us, um, uh, you would have been using a similar survey for the past few years. We've put a lot of time and effort into um, revising that, looking at the contents, making sure that it's as efficient as possible. Uh, as possible. And in that process of coming up with that new engagement survey as well, we've continued to refresh the benchmarks across all industries. So if you haven't already moved to our, our newer, shorter survey, speak to um, the project lead who works with your organisation and he or she can show you through the, that content. Um, Perhaps not so exciting to you, but exciting to us. We've also been spending a lot of time with the new website, which will be launching around about Christmas. Um, a couple of big events on the tech side of things. So um, second quarter 2020, we'll be releasing a new update to our survey software, which will have real-time analytics, manager level permissions, action planning, um, basically um, real uh, live action dashboard that you'll be able to drill down into to your results. We've had a similar kind of cross tabs previously, but this is taking it to the next level. So we're very excited about that. We're also um, partnering with Qualtrics. So Qualtrics probably has the most sophisticated bit of survey technology out there. So if that's what you're after and need for your surveys, we can work with Qualtrics um, technology. So just give us a yell um, if you want to do that in your next project. So that's enough for us. Um, I will now um, start to uh, hand over the job to my fellow panellists here. Before I dive into their individual presentations, I have a couple of icebreaker questions um, which I'd like to throw their way. Um, the first one is, um, please share a funny or warm example of how you or your work colleagues manage wellbeing at work. And the second question, is, uh, do you have a tip for a great book, learning resource um, or tool for managing wellbeing? And I'll give you a quick answer to that based on our experience at Voice Project. Um, and that's get a dog. Um, that's our resident pooch at Voice Project. You might have noticed the branded shirt um, that Duke is wearing. Um, Duke is... Uh, 
uh, owned by Lauren Gatt, who in fact has organised this webinar and the breakfast events that we've been doing um, recently. And Duke visits us once or twice a week. And you can't help but feel the stress drip away a little when you look at that face in the morning. So that's my first tip about managing wellbeing at work. So I will now hand over to our speakers. Um, and maybe if I can just kind of roll through the table as we're, we're seated here. Lou, mm. what's your well, you've what are your taken answers? one of them already from our workplace, Duke. Um, <clears throat> but I guess the other example that um, I really enjoy in our workplace um, is the efforts of our people manager, Beck, who's also our director of fun, uh, and the effort that she puts into celebrations um, in our office. Um, if you come and visit us at the moment, you, it's a bit like a department store <laughs> on steroids with all of our Christmas decorations. So we go big with our celebrations um, and we have cake and we have, we have games and we dress up for some of them and when we run out of things to celebrate, we make things up like Pokemon Day and Star Wars, Star Wars Day on May the 4th and things like that. So it's lots of fun. All right. Brilliant. And your tip book uh, or...? Book? <clears throat> Um, so, a book that I read recently um, is called The Fearless Organisation by Amy Edmondson from Harvard Business School. And it is about how to make the workplace a safe place to speak up um, on um, just presenting ideas, uh, raising concerns, uh, reporting issues or mistakes. Um, but how do we make it a psychologically safe workplace? Um, and her book is really good. It goes into the research evidence, but it also has some great case studies and tips and a good Q&A section at the back. Yeah. Mm. All right. Brilliant. Thank you. Claire? Uh, for us at Jewish Care, it's all about food. In fact, uh, I walked around the office this morning and there was an awful lot of cake that was being brought in from weekend events, um, which... Uh, colleagues wanted to donate to other colleagues. And you're saying the cake's um, good for wellbeing well, health? Well, I did actually <laughs> make the disclaimer that I won't be responsible for the work health <laughs> safety implications of the cake. Um, but every festival, uh, birthdays, uh, any event, uh, there is food around. And we often joke that when we're having a community event, there seems to be a bit of over-ordering going on. So there's enough for colleagues to be having afterwards. So it's all about food and food providing an opportunity for people to come together, mm. debrief and socialise. Mm. Right. Lovely. Uh, and my tip yeah. is uh, Intelligent Leadership by Alistair Mand, probably one of the first leadership books I read. Um, it's Australian. Mm. He's got great examples about leadership and he also talks a lot about respect at all levels throughout an organisation. All right. Brilliant. Thank you. Lucy. Well, I guess... In terms of managing well-being at work, it follows on from the others and it's about the opportunity to celebrate, but it's also the opportunity to speak up. So our office decided to say NUP to the Melbourne Cup recently. People felt that they could raise that as an issue of concern, that they didn't necessarily want to participate in the way we had previously, but wanted to celebrate. So again, a celebration around food, bringing in food, connecting with each other, but just putting something that was giving them some moral distress, I think, to one side and enjoying each other's company. In terms of the book or learning, I go um, back even further to How to Win Friends and Influence People, Dale Carnegie. I think it's still as relevant today as it was 50 plus years ago when it was written or more, um, almost 70 years ago when it was written. But Carnegie also wrote another book about stopping to stop worrying at work. And I think there's some really important tips in there that we now see through backed up by evidence around creating a safe space to speak up mm. and a safe place to be vulnerable and that the workplace can be that place. Mm. All right, great. Thank you, Lucy. I apologise to all our Melbourne crowds. <laughs> I hope you haven't turned off as a result of saying up to the Melbourne Cup. Um, we still celebrated a voice project for what the for what that's worth. All right. Um, all right. Moving on, um, now to hear from the presenters. As I said, we'll kind of move through um, Lou, Claire and Lucy, about eight minutes or so each, and we'll leave questions um, towards the end. So we'll get through all of the presentations and we'll come back to questions at the end. 
So, our first person um, is Lou. Dr Louise Parks is a senior consultant and head of research at Voice Project um, and is also our longest tenured member of staff and she's been willing to work and shown the patience to work with me for 16, almost 16 years. So thank you very much, um, Lou, for, for that. Um, Lou has extensive experience in wellbeing, engagements, leadership, customer experience across all sectors, but has a particular passion for the two ends of the life spectrum and in particular working with schools and aged care. Um, Lou's also non-executive director at Hammond Care, where she chairs the Equality, Safety and Risk Committee. So I'll hand over to Lou. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> um, so welcome to me, uh, from me to everyone as well. Um, hopefully you have received in your inbox this morning some resources and materials from us. Um, to complement the webinar. And one of the things that is in there is a research report um, that we have just published. Um, and again, Lauren Gatt was quite instrumental in, in um, helping us put that together. So thank you to Lauren. Um, it sh shows the results from a survey across the workforce in Australia of 5,000 people, asking them about their wellbeing and their work environment. Um, so I encourage you to have a look through that. I'm happy to answer questions on some of the interesting findings in there. Um, but I thought to start with that I would just um, draw your attention to four main points that I think um, come out of that report. <coughs> uh, so the first point that um, I would like to make um, is that work is actually good for our wellbeing. And I feel compelled to... to um, highlight that to our attention because there is a bit of a perception out there that work is a necessary evil. Um, it's something that is not healthy or good for us. Um, it's in opposition to life when we have that work-life balance discussion. And certainly in the responses from um, our survey, about a quarter of the respondents um, said that they couldn't find anything in their workplace that was, had a positive impact on their wellbeing. Um, instead, it was actually getting away from the workplace at the end of the day or the countdown to retirement um, and that kind of thing. Um, but actually, we know that um, work is good um, for our wellbeing. We know that when people have been unemployed, if they move into the workforce, their mental health improves. Um, and we were talking the other day about how when people retire, that is another challenging transition point for people um, with their mental health when they leave the workforce. Um, and you can see there I've listed a number of different ways that the workforce meets some of our basic psychological needs. Um, so um, things like autonomy and significance, meaning and purpose are all needs that can be met in the workplace. Um, and one of the things that people mentioned the most actually in our survey um, about the positive things in the workplace were those relationships that we've just been talking about in terms of the social inclusion and the social interaction um, that workplaces afford. Um, so that's something that people um, really value and is good for our wellbeing. Um, so you'll see that our measure of wellbeing uh, in the report is not just about um, the absence of stress or negativity, but it is actually about um, a positive impact of the workplace and having more positive than negative um, emotions, for example, um, while you're at work. Um, but clearly, uh, work is not always good and the workplace is not always healthy for us. So we had 59% um, of our survey respondents say that they didn't feel well at work and there was a a really big discrepancy between um, the levels of wellbeing across industries, for example, which just shows us that, yes, work and the workplace um, are not always um, healthy and good for us. Which leads me to my second point um, that I'd like to make, and that is um, I think we really need to see a shift um, towards how we can make workplaces and work more healthy um, rather than focusing on fixing workers. Uh, and by that I mean, if we think about some of the workplace wellbeing programs that are on offer, um, a lot of them are about um, making us more healthy. 
it's how we can eat better, exercise more, take those breaks from work, be trained in things like mindfulness and resilience and so on. Um, so it's the yoga and the fruit bowl and all of that kind of thing. Um, all of those programs are focused on individuals um, and they're rather than the work and the workplace itself. And they're focused on the symptoms of work and the workplace um, rather than the source of some of those stresses in the workplace. Um, and because there is that kind of separation between work and the workplace and these wellbeing programs focused on individuals, we see the shift in responsibility from leaders within organisations to individuals and to HR to just have add-on programs that are unrelated to what's happening in the workplace itself. Um, but it's really important that leaders do actually take responsibility and accountability for wellbeing in the workplace. Um, they do have a duty to provide a safe and healthy work environment for staff. Um, so it is really important that they do do the hard work of working out what it is, is it about our, our work, our organisation, our industry that um, are the greatest stresses um, for people who are in our workforce. Um, so one of the ways that you can do that, do that is to do this kind of analysis where you look at all of the different work systems and practices and how they impact um, on wellbeing, on staff wellbeing. So this is one of the outputs that you'll see in the research report. Um, and it is looking at the impact of those practices on wellbeing across that whole sample of 5,000 staff. Of course, you can do this for your own organisation as well. Um, so in the top right-hand corner, you can see some things that we might expect that would have a high impact on staff wellbeing. Things like having a manageable workload, um, having flexibility um, to manage your work um, and, um, and having good, strong um, supervisor support, for example. Uh, but in the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see things that are even further on that right-hand side. That is, they have an even closer relationship with staff wellbeing um, and a bigger impact. And they're things like um, involvement in decision-making, um, recognition, uh, confidence in leadership, uh, and change management, how well change is managed. <coughs> uh, and so that leads me to my third point, uh, which is I think we really need to be advocating for organisations to have a wellbeing strategy um, rather than a bunch of wellbeing programs. Um, so, and a good start would to be focus, focusing on any of four of these core workplace practices um, we've included in um, your materials a tip sheet on each of these things because there's so much we could say actually on all of them and I'm ha happy to come back to them at, at question time. Um, and I've also listed there um, some key resources that you can look up as well in terms of some books and our annual change challenge case studies of organisations that work with us and have told us about their change stories. Um, I guess one point to note there that was... I think interesting coming out of the research was around change, particularly in that uh, there was actually no correlation between the amount of significant change that people reported were, go were experiencing in their workplace and their wellbeing. So wellbeing didn't vary uh, depending on whether there was little change or a lot of change, um, but the highest impact factor was how well that change was being managed. So finally, of all of those four areas that we just looked at, actually most of them and a lot of the research that looks at those practices is in relation to um, organisational performance and engagement. We know they're linked to all of those things. Um, so it's not surprising then that we do see a very strong correlation between all those three outcomes, um, between wellbeing, engagement and organisational performance. Um, and the data that you can see here is from another study that um, we've conducted and each of those dots there represents an organisation. Um, but you can see there's a really strong correlation between wellbeing and engagement. Um, and the green dots that you can see are those high performing organisations which are for the most part occurring up there in that top right hand quadrant um, where there is high wellbeing and high engagement. 
Um, so I think it's a really important message, particularly for leaders to hear, that you don't have to sacrifice performance and engagement um, when you're looking to improve wellbeing. Mm. Mm. All right, brilliant. Thank you, Lou. And uh, please send through those questions and we'll address those a little bit later when the other presenters have uh, delivered their piece. So now I'd like to introduce um, Claire Burnham. Claire is the Chief Executive Officer at Jewish Care and has been since 2007. She came to the non-government sector after many years in senior executive roles in New South Wales state government departments. Claire started her career as a social worker in the 1970s and has worked across most areas of human services, including health, justice and disability. Jewish Care is the major provider of social services um, for the New South Wales Jewish community, with over, over 280 staff in areas of community aged care, disability services, mental health programs and responding to families and individuals in need. And one of the reasons why we've involved Claire in, these, uh, in this webinar and the breakfast we've just delivered is that Jewish Care is one of the highest performing organisations um, as far as wellbeing is concerned. But as you'll hear, it hasn't been a specific focus for them. So I'll hand over to Claire. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. Um, I never set out to increase staff wellbeing at Jewish Care. In fact, I've always struggled working with a focus on the clients and the community, which is what we're about, with a focus on staff. In fact, our mission statement says to increase the wellbeing and resilience independence of community members in need. There's no mention of staff. Over time, I have uh, reconciled this challenge by having what I describe as a yin-yang approach, which recognises a focus on community and clients, people in need, with a focus on staff. And in accepting that as Chief Executive Officer, I have a responsibility for the wellbeing of staff, I look at what it is that I can have an impact on. And I can have a huge impact on setting the environment in which people come to work every day. And we know what it's like to work, we, all, we know what it's like to work in a place which makes us well because we know when we've worked in places which are now described as toxic, how unwell that can make you and how stressed and unhappy. Mm. Um, so I took uh, a lot of learning around leadership um, and wellbeing and put in place a number of strategies across the organisation which focuses on having high staff engagement, which then deliver great client service. And we now have the research which says happy, well staff give great client service. And I think ultimately that allows me uh, to reconcile the, that two focuses. Some of the things that we've done at Jewish Care, um, one of the first things is about giving staff a context or the big picture for what is happening. So with the introduction of client-held budgets into the human services sector, making the point that this is happening across uh, the sector, across Australia, not just within Jewish care, that we had to focus on becoming a provider of choice in the community and that the iceberg had well and truly melted when it came to losing block funding. So giving staff that context and the big picture really helps them make decisions and judgments about um, what's in the best interests of the organisation and our community. The second one is about no secrets. Um, mushrooms thrive in the dark. It makes most of us anxious to not know what's going on. Um, so I think absolutely, trans absolutely transparent about what's happening in the organisation, not just the external pressures, but the pressures we're going through um, in terms of budgets, culture, um, I think people respond really well to the challenge and understanding that um, they're involved in um, making decisions around the organisation. The third one is uh, you can take a clock apart, you can polish the parts and you can put it back together, it remains a clock. Organisations are frogs, not clocks. You begin to uh, take off an, uh, a leg of the frog, polish it up, try and reattachment. It's not going to be a frog anymore. And, in fact, you lose a lifeblood and a sense of an organisation when you start restructuring and reorganising. So I choose to have restructuring as the last option 
not the first option when managing change. Fourth one is around supporting with training and systems. Um, I was interested to see technology not as a priority in managing performance and engagement. Uh, when the photocopier doesn't work, I can tell you there are a lot of stressed people around the office, the computers don't turn on, um, people don't know what to do with themselves. Uh, you've got to support staff by upgrading systems, giving them training. For example, we've had a focus on public speaking for staff so they're able to go out because they're part of the marketing team in the organisation, um, focusing on client service and what that means to deliver a high quality of service. Focusing on field staff, um, most of our staff are out in the community, not actually in the office. However, we've been a very office-centric organisation. Uh, for example, our end-of-year staff party was always at one o'clock in the afternoon, uh, which wasn't allowing a lot of staff to attend. So we now have it at 6.30 in the evening. Um, giving people mobility devices, encouraging them to come into the office, pulling, them, pulling together with training and induction. Um, may, make sure that they're linked in and supported and they're the face of the organisation out in the community, so making sure that they are well. Being ethical and staying with mission, uh, yes, we do charge clients fees now um, from their packages for services that we deliver. That made staff a lot uh, uncomfortable about how you do that. So one of the things which I think can create a lot of anxiety and stress in an organisation is if staff feel there's no congruence between the values of the organisation and way, the way we behave. We are now a community business and we need to ensure that the way we're running that business um, is ethical. And uh, we've therefore developed a set of operating principles and an ethical framework um, and we share that with staff to know that we are being transparent and ethical in the way we manage. The final one is around the challenge of running a lot of organisations, which is the head and the heart. Um, we talk uh, a lot about finances and budgets and breaking it even, but that's not why staff are coming to work. They're coming to work to make a difference, to be passionate about what they deliver. So we need to talk about both and we need to keep staff in the picture about how, as an organisation, we're balancing a focus on community and clients with a focus on running a community business. So my commitment has been to give staff a great work environment which contributes to their health and wellbeing and increases uh, their commitment to great client service. And we've used the voice survey in over 10 years to be monitoring how we're going and some of our results over that 10 years has shown that an understanding about organisational direction has moved 22 points to an 84% favourable position. Uh, confidence in leadership has moved to an 83% favourable. Um, so I consider they're the sort of levers which, um, as Louise has pointed out, are the ones which actually increase staff engagement and, I believe, performance. And then we have the ones which people more traditionally think about as health and wellbeing, safety, from 37 points to a 92% favourable, so people feel safe coming to work, and wellness, 14 points to an 88% favourable position. So over those 10 years, we've used voice um, to be telling us what's happening within the organisation, and the analogy is I need them to keep the finger on the pulse of the frog. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, brilliant. Thank you, Claire. There's one thing you're going to remember from this, it's the frog. <laughs> certainly one of the things I'm remembering from these ones. Is, and it's a great analogy in terms of learning, uh, losing that sort of life essence when you start pulling things together. But unfortunately, I now have this image of a Frankenstein frog, <laughs> which I'm trying to deal with. Um, so can we just bump that over to the next um, slides? All right. Again, keep those questions coming through. If you have any top of mind um, for Claire right now, hit that little 
blue hand and send through your questions. Our next and final speaker for today um, is Lucinda Brogdon. Lucy is the Chair and Commissioner of our National Mental Health Commission. In addition to her focus on mental health and wellbeing in the workplace, she also has a particular passion about issues facing women and girls in our society. Lucy has more than 25 years commercial experience in accounting, finance and organisational psychology and takes an evidence-based approach um, to problem solving and social investment. And in recognition of her contribution um, this year, Lucy was um, honoured with becoming a member of the Order of Australia. So thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Peter. Thank you all for tuning in today. I want to talk to you a little bit about the work of the National Mental Health Commission and why it is that we are talking well workplaces at the highest level of, of policy. And it truly is because we believe work is good for people, but also good for business. I guess it wouldn't be a conversation around psychology if we didn't invoke Freud at some point. And he did say that love and work are the cornerstones of our humanness. And I think really at the heart of a well workplace is one where we can bring our humanity, our love for one another uh, to the workplace to really support each other on that important journey. The National Mental Health Commission was established in 2012. We're an executive agency of the Commonwealth Government and we report to the Minister for Health and twice yearly with the Minister for Health and the Prime Minister sit down to talk about really all sorts of levers around the country and around public policy that impact the wellbeing of all Australians. We look at these issues through the framework called the Contributing Life that says that Australians should all be thriving and not just surviving have access to effective support, care and treatment, and in the context of work, that we all have something meaningful to do and something to look forward to, that we have connections to family, friends and community, and we feel safe, stable and secure. But it's that something meaningful to do and something to look forward to that really, in a person-centred, person-led model of care that we are developing as a policy framework, puts workplaces front and centre in that journey. The majority of us spend most of our waking hours at work and so it's important that our workplaces are psychologically safe as well as physically safe but that they can also support recovery for those of us that have been unwell and experienced mental illness or physical injury. Two opportunities to do that through the work of Commission and Public Policy are through the Mentally Healthy Workplace Alliance and the Collaborative Partnership and I want to talk a little bit about both of these pieces of work. The Mentally Healthy Workplace Alliance brings together a number of key players. We have the Australian Council of Trade Unions, the Business Council of Australia, Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, the Australian Industry Group and the Council for Small Business sitting at a table with Safe Work and Comcare and others to really look at what does it mean to provide a mentally healthy workplace, a workplace that is both physically safe but psychologically safe. And it still surprises me even today that I will go into some workplaces and CEOs and the board may not fully appreciate their obligations around psychological safety. And if they do understand the obligation, they're then challenged with what does that look like and how do I best do it? We were very pleased in the April budget of this year to be given $11.5 million for the National Workplace Initiative to really try and upskill all Australian workplaces when it comes to creating that safe place for people to work. The other program that the National Mental Health Commission is part of is an initiative of Comcare but works with the Department of Employment, Department of Social Services and it's a collaborative partnership looking at the health benefits of work. Good work is good for you. And so how do we really help workplaces understand how to increase participation for people that have been out due to injury come back in, or those that have never participated, participate, while at the same time keeping everybody in a safe place. So these are really two important initiatives in that design program. One of the first pieces of work that the Alliance did, as with most big projects, is to start with a literature review and really think about what it is that workplaces need to address if they want to be that psychologically safe workplace. And you'll see from this slide that there is no mention of yoga and fruit bowls. It actually starts at smarter work design, promoting and facilitating early help seeking and intervention, building a positive and safe work culture. 
And it's really important for those of us listening today to reflect on our own teams and environment. How readily would our staff feel that at their workplace, working with you and colleagues is a safe place to disclose something they're struggling with? And it's a really interesting question to reflect on because I think it's a good barometer for the culture of your organisation. It's around enhancing personal and organisational resilience. And colleagues and those of you that have heard me speak before will know that I say that in a workplace context, I'm not really a fan of the word resilience because I think it actually is really insulting to our people. There are some roles, first responders and others, that have to deal with some incredibly traumatic situations well beyond their span of control psychologically and physically and we need to support them with strategies. But for the majority of us, often we find that resilience training is brought into a workplace where the culture is not so healthy, might be toxic. And so we're really saying, you have to learn to deal with this poor environment rather than us being prepared to invest in fixing the culture and the environment of the workplace. So I think we've got the wrong end of the spectrum there. It's also about supporting recovery. Generally, we are really well trained in our workplaces to look after people with physical injury and we can address that through first aid and we're often quite good at supporting them to return to work after physical injury. But our research and that work, re the research we've conducted with um, ComCare will show that really our workplaces across the board have pretty low levels of competency and capacity to support recovery and return to work for people with psychological injury. And more, more generally, we need to increase the awareness around mental illness and reduce stigma. And when we use the word stigma, we're actually talking about discrimination in a workplace context. And I think it's really important that we reflect on not just the policies and procedures of our organisation, but the culture, the language, and the way we describe mental health issues to ensure that it is a stigma-free workplace. I've talked too about the collaborative partnership and some of the important work that we've done there and working with them it might be of interest to you to know that actually our GPs don't receive any occupational health training. So when we are looking at things like return to work, our GPs are not well placed to sometimes make that assessment. So a critical partnership program is working with the College of GPs to skill them and bring that into core curriculum. We also know that there's low levels of literacy amongst our hiring managers, whether that's internal recruiters or external, around recovery from injury. How do we upskill those workforces? So these are some big systems education programs that we're looking at. I think in bringing all that together, we have a real, really strong opportunity in Australia where it is essentially an egalitarian community to create not just physically safe workplaces, but mentally and psychologically safe workplaces. And it is good for business. Thank you. All right, brilliant. Thank you, Lucy and Claire and Lou. Um, and now for the, some questions. Um, where do you see the support for wellbeing? Um, is it largely coming from the CEO, coming from HR within workplaces? To what level are CEOs in support of uh, wellbeing, health and safety initiatives within organisations? I, I believe, as you can hear, that the responsibility sits with the CEO, that it is about the culture and the environment in which people work, um, and I believe that's the responsibility of the CEO and the board, um, and that everyone who's managing staff um, understands that and ensures that the way people are working keeps them well. Lucy, maybe CEOs should yes. take responsibility for it, but are they? Uh, what's your experience? Look, Peter, it's a really good question and I think the experience we've had is that all CEOs should because they are bound by legislation to provide a, a workplace that's not just free of physical harm but is free of psychological harms. But what we've found is there's not a lot of CEOs that are aware of that obligation. And so there's a real challenge for those of us that work in people management roles to educate up. But I think it's also around the team understanding their responsibility. When we look industry-wide, we see that those industries, manufacturing, industrial, those that have had to focus on physical safety, generally have a better appreciation around their obligations for psychological safety. But there's a learning journey to be had. Mm. Mm. Any other tips for getting 
a CEO is not necessarily resistant, but is just doesn't have wellbeing, health and safety as a focus, what would be some suggestions for getting such a person on board? Mm. Oh, one of, I mean, obviously, the, one of the key factors will be talking their language in terms of what they are interested in hearing about. So I think if you can make the connection between, um, you know, supporting wellbeing and staff engagement and um, performance and workforce pressures, then that will be important. So, for example, some of the studies that we've done um, show various outcomes. So we know there is a, a link between um, wellbeing because um, we did this study in one organisation across a number of sites and there was um, wellbeing was a significant predictor for safety incidents and work um, workers' compensation claims. So that has a big financial impact for organisations. Um, we know also that uh, well workplaces that have strong recognition, strong involvement, um, extend the working life of people, that is the capacity of people to work longer, mm. so by an average of about four years. Um, so when we're looking at sectors like disability services, aged care and so on that have workforce um, challenges and are trying to keep people in the sector, um, supporting their wellbeing is going to be really important. Um, and we know that um, there's now 15% of the workforce is over 65 compared to 6 or 5 or 6% 20 years ago. So it is going to be... And it's growing as key, well. Yeah, so it is going to be a key factor that will help us retain our talent in our, in our workforce. Mm. Mm. Any other thoughts? Look, I think one of the challenges we've seen for a while is um, companies will say, oh, I've invested so much in this already and not seen an outcome. Yeah. And so I think the challenge is for us to really help direct that investment mm -hmm. to good evidence-based programs mm -hmm. and actually make it part of the framework, not just a program mm. in and of itself, because that's, it needs to be in the DNA, the culture, and spread through to be everybody's responsibility. Mm. So I think helping CEOs see that you're making a strategic investment mm. in a broad approach to this um, and that it is evidence-based and well-evaluated will help them be more comfortable with the, the investment. Well, that taps into one of the questions we've received, which is, how do you evaluate or demonstrate the return on investment of wellbeing programs? It's never an easy thing to do for any, anything, whether it's wellbeing or any other training program or anything else. Um, but yes, how can that be done? Have you seen that being done well? Look, I think there have been some good examples of that. Um, Mental Health Australia had some programs, funded KPMG to do some evaluation work that um, showed positive return on some interventions and actually showed where it wasn't a good investment. So that can be just as helpful to using various ROI numbers. And, and the accounting firms generally have some tools out there. But I don't think you necessarily need to go and look at big, fancy new tools. We can look at things like our staff turnover rate, look at our engagement data, look at our absentee rates. These will give us some KPIs today that we're already capturing mm. and actually not only show us the return, but where we should be targeting our efforts. Yeah, I thought so. All right. Um, a question that's just come through is linking, or is there a link between wellbeing and bullying? So um, we go back a few years and bullying was getting a lot more coverage, perhaps, than it is now. It hasn't died away by any means and it's still an issue that a lot of organisations have to face. Um, what's the relationship? Do you try to tie these things together within a workplace? Um, mm. um, one of the things that, that I've seen come up more recently, um, I mean, obviously there is a link between wellbeing and, and bullying for those individuals that are involved, but it's not quite as widespread as some of the issues we've seen about um, respect and civility more generally in the workplace. And so there has been um, the emergence of some, you know, of interventions and programs to go in and teach people how to be respectful to each other um, and so on. Um, Again, it's a bit like the, the resilience programs and so on. One of the reasons that we find people are perhaps less patient and tolerant with, with each other is because they're working in a very stressful environment yeah. um, under heavy demands and workloads and so on. And we know that, and the research shows that there's that vicious cycle, if you like. So the more pressure, the less, you know, the more rudeness, less civil people are. And then that impacts on people's wellbeing in a vicious cycle. So, yes, by all means, 
go and encourage people to, um, you know, be more civil to each other, but I think you also need to deal with the stresses in the work environment mm. itself that are mm. making it harder for people to have that tolerance and patience with each other. Yeah, mm. OK. Yes, great answer. I'm reminded yes. of some research many, many years ago about British public servants. You must be able to find it for me, which... And I remember it resonated with me because it said that incidence of uh, cardiovascular disease and stress-related illness was actually higher in those lower-paid, lower-ranking public servants. Um, they expected to see it in the more senior public servants, mm. but a lot of it came round to a span of control, mm. understanding what was going on, a capacity to make decisions, see things through. So that's always stayed with me with a really strong message mm. Mm. about letting people know what's going on and keeping them informed. Yeah. 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 And that did come up in our research yes. report as well. So if you, you'll notice that when we looked at seniority in the organisation, yes, workload does go up um, in more senior positions, but wellness doesn't go down accordingly. It actually improves um, with seniority along with things like involvement in decision making and better recognition and all the things that go with those more senior positions. Unless you're working more than 45 hours. Unless yes. you're working, yes. <laughs> then the research suggests that the wellbeing starts to come down. There's yeah. this kind of cut off around about 45 yeah. hours, which yeah. is interesting. But I think it, it's interesting where we're heading in this conversation. And I think it was the Whitehall studies that, that pulled a lot of those um, elements together around understanding the hierarchy, but really, in a sense, everything old is new again because a lot of the things that play to engagement and wellbeing are what we know from the theories of motivation and, and Hertzberger 50 years ago. And so some of these do come to civility and respect and recognition. And so for companies, they're not big investments that need to be made. It's actually mm -hmm. looking at programs that are probably already there mm. and, and enhancing them and, and thinking about the humans that work for them. Yeah. Mm. I think the question in the voice survey is around bullying, whether it's being tolerated. Yes. Isn't it? So that's mm. the message to send. Yes. It may occur, you may not be able to control that, mm. but when it does occur and is reported, what's the organisation seem to be doing about it? And I think yeah. that's often the same with performance issues, um, that mm. when people become aware of things, it's about what's the organisation doing? Are we ignoring it? Mm. Are we acting upon it? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. All right, another question that's come through, specifically focused upon an individual's financial circumstances and the impact upon wellbeing. And maybe that question could be expanded to other personal circumstances, whether it be financial or social or anything else. Mm. Um, to what degree is it an organisation's responsibility to try to address that? And has that been done well? Can mm. that be done well? Mm. Look, I think financial security, we know, is a key determinant to any individual's wellbeing, and that's really important. I think there are some opportunities for workplaces, and one example that I'm familiar with where it's actually looked at their staff's financial security is Woolies, Woolworths, big employer, and they noticed that some of their staff were big users of payday lending. Now, payday lending often sits closely with gambling issues. And so what they've been able to do, they have a banking licence at Woolies, so we don't all have access to that. What was come up with an alternative product to help some of their staff that were becoming a bit beholden to the payday lending model, give them an alternative product, but combine that with some support around what other, something else that might be going on for them, whether it's gambling addiction issues, etc. So I think, it, for me, that's an example of also know your staff really know what's going on for them and how can you best and most appropriately support your staff in the context that you're operating in? Mm. Mm. It's, it's like those ethical principles I was talking about, mm. about trying to reduce employment of casuals, yeah. casualising the workforce. And it is a real challenge at the moment um, for employers, but I'm very conscious that we should be setting out to provide people with if it's part-time, at least permanent part-time hours, mm. um, to give mm. people some security of uh, wages at the end of the fortnight. Mm. Mm. I agree. And I think there's... Um, we may have mentioned it in a previous breakfast um, prior to this, was something like 30% of people um, within your workplace are at any one time suffering some kind of mental health issue. Yeah. Um, and for an employer or for a manager or for a leader, just having that 
And that's been a little bit of an eye-opener for me, I have to confess, that look at your employees through that lens, that they're not just there, the people that present themselves at work, which can often have a bit of impression management happening, but there's, they've got a whole life behind them and all the complications, and there's probably a decent percentage of them that are, are struggling in one way or another as well. And I think that can help increase that level of respect that a leader can um, display within the workplace. So, yeah. I think um, that linked yeah. in with transitions um, and you know, yes. being aware, as you say, about marriages are breaking down, adult, uh, children are doing high school certificate, there's a stress point for staff. Um, but I've also become really aware of uh, people struggling to support their adult children who are going through mental health issues mm. and recognising the support they're needing um, mm. to be able to come to work or not to come to work. Mm provide that support at home. And uh, we wouldn't have seen that as carers leave even five years ago, giving people permission to be sharing what's happening at home and be seeking support. Yes. Yeah, great. Um, another question is related to the impact of client demands upon managing well-being within a workplace. Um, and in a previous life, I worked at Accenture and there's certainly um, almost obsessive uh, focus upon the customer experience and if a customer wants something you jump at that point um, and there are a lot of professional services or a lot of services that rely heavily upon a client service element. There is this desire of a workplace to meet the customer's demands but then they can have a huge impact it seems upon the employee experience. Yeah. Your comments. Was, you know, I remember years ago when people were talking about work health and safety and there was a focus on trying to reduce manual handling and having those difficult conversations. Um, as staff go out and do, we do most of our work in people's homes, doing that assessment of that environment. And I think it's only in the last few years that we've realised that that environment also includes the behaviour of the client towards the staff member mm -hmm. and having those conversations with clients and sometimes their families about the way we're expecting them to behave when we send a, a staff member yeah. into the workplace. Mm. Look, I think um, workplaces have two sides to that lever because they're the purchaser of services and they're the provider yes. often of services. And so I think um, we see some progressive companies actually thinking about their own purchasing strategy and what they're going to expect of their clients in terms of what they're purchasing, hours of work. I was talking to a law firm recently where um, the client had stipulated the number of hours anyone working on their work could work provide in a given day mm. and they were quite strict about that. Equally, I've heard professional services firms now taking the courage to push back and say, do you really need that tomorrow? Because the best answer will come in a couple more days. And so I think we've got sometimes to have to have that courage to push back and say, you know, it's not in the best interests of the team. And when they've done that, they found that the client's actually gone, oh, yeah, look, I was just asking for tomorrow, but tomorrow was an arbitrary thing. So I think both sides around that. One of the issues that goes to a well workplace um, is often the role of alcohol. And increasingly, the industrial and manufacturing sector are requiring their clients, those providing services to them, to follow a dry model of, of business if they want to work with them. So I think we've got two sides to work with. Mm. Mm. And I would probably just add that, I mean, we love flexibility, but it is one of those things that is enabling this mm. kind of 24-7 response, that you never switch off and that you can respond at any time. Um, and when I think about the examples um, of some of the organisations I've worked with to uh, improve their wellbeing, two of them, to, in two cases, they have been about how you manage the expectations of your mm. clients. And so these were um, universities and independent schools mm. where um, the expectation is very high to res be responding to students or parents. Um, and the school just had to be very clear um, to, to students and parents about the expectations, about what, when you could expect a response mm. um, to protect staff. But then they also, in both cases, university and school, 
had to be very clear to leaders about managing their boundaries mm. and not to send emails out on mm. the weekend and expect a response immediately or send it late at night and expect something the next day. So it's sometimes, yes, it is clients and customers, but it's also then managers who are putting those expectations on, yeah. on staff as well. Yeah, they're both really interesting industries in that um, the costs for a customer have been increasing as well. And then with um, university students paying more um, uh, independent schools, the fees going up for that, there's often that comes with a higher expectation that you're going to meet my needs immediately. Um, so that's that can be very hard to manage. Yeah. Um, I, there was a question about, have you seen any bad examples um, of wellbeing initiatives um, and what's, what are the lessons to have learnt from those? Well, I think the evidence tells us, and, and Tony LaMontagna down in um, Victoria has done a lot of work around this, will say not so much examples of where it doesn't work, but that it's really important that you address the negative issues before you try and bring in the positive stuff. We employ intelligent, capable people who will see through veneer and brushing over and trying to whitewash toxic, poor practice, whatever it might be, with a yoga and fruit bowls approach. So mm. I think the, the real um, message is you have to tackle some of the hard stuff first mm. before you can bring in the shiny, mm. fun stuff. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, the only, you're talking about uh, tackling the negative rather than the positive. One experience I've had is going back to that bullying issue that sometimes if you focus upon bullying though, that can then just drive a, a narrative within an organisation and the whole focus then tends to be about the negative behaviour rather than promoting the positive. Has that been your experience or how would you reconcile that with your um, previous advice? Well, I guess it would be more looking at the, the antecedents to the incivility and, and tackling some of those issues of culture or demands or span yeah. of control, whatever might be sitting under that, rather than saying we're just going to jump on bullying because you're right. And I think this bullying word is very easy to, to throw into the mix. One person's bullying might be another person's performance management, might be micro management, and, and that's not a conversation for today. Mm. But it's, it's really what's sitting behind this and... I think um, that's the lesson on a lot of these changes in people's performance or, or behaviour or, or the nature of what they're coming to with work should actually be a flag of concern, not a flag of punishment or mm. and mm. being able to support them. I always think about leadership, you know, that keeping in mind the adage about as parents, you know, it isn't about what you say, it's what you do. Mm. I think people very closely watch the behaviour of leaders mm. um, and role model that. And you cannot be asking for behaviour in an organisation if it's not congruent with the way you yourself are behaving. Yeah. yeah. All right. Brilliant. And that's probably a really good way to finish up, given that we are approaching 2.30 here in Sydney and um, some of you may need to go elsewhere and have other responsibilities. So I will wrap up. Um, Lou, Claire and Lucy, thank you very much for your contribution, not just today, but in the previous breakfast that we've run in Sydney and Melbourne as well. I hope you found it useful. I hope there's been a couple of ideas in there that you can apply to your workplaces. Um, there is a feedback form on, the, on, on your interface in the webinar, so we would love to get your feedback um, about uh, your experience and uh, what we might be able to do a little bit better in the future. And other than that, so we will send out um, the make available to you the, all the slides, um, so you'll have those. But other than that, I hope you found it valuable. Uh, we run these events uh, twice per year, um, so please contact us individually. We're all on LinkedIn, for example, um, or make sure that we've got your contact details if you want to be invited to, to future events. So thanks for joining us. I hope you found it valuable. Have a great day. See you.